An option is American style if we can exercise it before maturity or before expiration. A classic academic question is, should we exercise it early or is it optimal to early exercise the American style option? Here, I'll look at the general rules from a superficial perspective and then show you mathematically why we get these rules and how we can quantify that question of whether it is optimal to early exercise an American style option. I start here with the superficial rule set that answer the question, is it optimal to exercise early the American style option? If we can exercise early, by definition, it's American style. And so you can see we have four scenarios here. If it's a stock that does not pay a dividend, so it's an option on a non-dividend paying stock, that's this column here. And you can see the call option we say mathematically should never be exercised early and the put, it might be optimal to exercise early. If we introduce dividends, so we shift over to this column here, you'll notice for either the call or the put, it may be optimal to exercise early. So the only thing that changes with dividends is the call shifts from never to maybe. Another way to look at this is that of the four scenarios, the only option where we can say mathematically it's never optimal to exercise early is the American call on a non-dividend paying stock. For all of the scenarios, it may be optimal to exercise early. So how can we think about this? Well, there are a few forces that go into this and I admit technically I'm going to, I'm going to, I admit that technically I'm going to omit or not talk about volatility and insurance effects and focus rather on the strike price and the dividend that I think are much easier to understand. And so first, what does it mean to exercise early? Well, we think about, for example, a strike price of $10. If we hold a call option, early exercise is the right but not the obligation to pay this fixed strike price earlier rather than later all of the things being equal, an assumption I will use often here throughout, all of the things being equal, if you're gonna pay $10, you would just prefer to pay it later rather than sooner. In fact, the cost to you is the PV of $10, and the further off in the future you can put that, the lower your cost. That's if you're a call. Consider if it's a put. The put, if you hold a put or a long a put, it's the right but not the obligation to sell the stock and receive the strike. The strike again is cash. So that's my one of my main tips here is to think about the strike price as cash. If it's a call, that's cash paid. If it's a put, it's cash received. If you have the put and the strike is 10, all other things being equal, the Cerritos Paribus assumption, would you rather receive the $10 today or in the future? Well, in fact, you'd rather receive it today, so it's the opposite. And so with respect to the strike price, you can see because the call pays that strike price, that strike price is cash paid and you would prefer to defer, that by itself discourages early exercise. And so you can start to see why there's a difference between the call and the put. The put, on the other hand, receives that fixed strike price, receives that cash, all of the things being, all of the things being equal, prefers to receive it sooner, and that encourages early exercise. What about dividends? Well, dividends are really sort of the opposite or the mirror image of that cash as strike price. If you're a call, while you hold that option, you actually forego the receipt of dividends and all, all of the all of the things being equal, you'd prefer to get the dividends. So the greater the dividends are, the more you are encouraged to early exercise your call, right? Because that means you get the stock and you get the dividends, which you did not get while you held the call option. The put's a little trickier, but I think the easiest way to think about that is in my last video here, I'm in, going in sequence here, I said that a really an evergreen rule that helps us throughout option pricing here is that the dividend deducts from the stock price. I explained why in the previous video. 
Well, the dividend putting downward pressure on the stock price makes this put more valuable and discourages early exercise. So it works in the opposite direction of the call with respect to just the dividends. And so these are the two forces that we can think about, strike price and dividend impacting the early exercise. If I go even deeper into my spreadsheet here, which can be downloaded, and that download includes my hidden rows where I price these options according to the Black Scholes Merton as usual. And so here I have, as usual, my input assumptions all six of them in yellow, but I've highlighted the dividend yield. And that's because the only difference as I go from this column to this column to this column is you can see I increase the dividends from 0% here. So this is um, a call option that is in the money because the stock price of 25 is above 20. It's in the money, but it's an option on a non-dividend paying stock. And then I increase the dividend yield. Here I price the option, and then here we have the lower bound per formula as I reviewed in a previous video, and then the intrinsic value. And as I said, this is an in-the-money call option with intrinsic value of $5. And you'll notice here in orange, which is the focus of this sheet, I've got what's called what I call the weighting value. And again, if, we, the, if we're the call option, Hold, if we hold an American style call option, we can exercise now and pay the strike, which is K, or wait to pay the strike in the future that has present value of K discounted at the risk free rate, right? Pretty straightforward. That difference I'm calling the waiting value. And that waiting value in this case, because my option term is six months and my risk free rate is 5%, the waiting value here is 50% regardless. Then I've also included here the present value of the dividend. And that's where I take the dividend yield and translate it into um, its lump sum present value equivalent per a formula here that I will uh, that I've annotated, that I'll annotate in the description, and I did that in the private prior video as well. Suffice to say that a continuous dividend yield can always be translated into its lump sum present value equivalent. So you can see here at a six percent continuous dividend yield or constant in proportion to the stock price over six months has a present value of 74 cents. And so then I can go down here to a simple test. I can compare the value of waiting or not early exercising to the present value of the dividend. Because consider here the non-dividend paying stock. Early exercise gets me no dividends because it's a non-dividend paying stock, but I do get the value of waiting, or, or I should say, if I don't exercise, I, I, I enjoy the benefit of waiting, which has a value of 50 cents. If I do, I get the dividend, but it has zero value. And per that general rule, it will not be, it's never optimal to exercise. Then I introduced a 3% dividend, so now early exercise would get me a present value of the dividend of 37 cents, but it's still not greater than the value of waiting. And so it would not be optimal. If I raise the dividend high enough to 6%, the present value of my dividend actually quite a bit exceeds the value of me waiting. And at this point, it becomes likely, maybe or likely optimal to exercise. You can see a very simple intuitive test here. For the put, a little different, maybe a little tougher in some respects, but I have a simple test here where I can compare the intrinsic value to the value of the European put. In this case, yes, European put in this case. Same thing here, dividends are increasing, only this time because it's a put, I have a stock of six and a strike of 10, so you'll notice I have an in the money put, and then the dividend yield increasing. And now we can start to understand why there's a conceptual difference or the main conceptual difference between a call and the put. Consider a, that again, strike price of $10. If we have a call, right, the call option becomes more valuable as the stock price increases and that stock price has no upper limit. So we say the call option has really an uncapped upside. 
Now, if it's a put, that's for the call, I'll do C here. If it's a put, on the other hand, the put becomes more valuable as the stock drops. However, unlike on the upside, there's a lower bound on the stock price. It is zero. This put option with strike of 10 has an upper bound of $10 because the stock can never go below zero. Notice there's an asymmetry there. That means that the put, as it becomes deeply in the money, it becomes very, it becomes very uh, preferable to exercise that because the closer you get to zero here, deeper and deeper in the money, there's less and less upside to enjoy. On the other hand, you run the risk of volatility unraveling your gains. So there's an asymmetry there. And this asymmetry helps to explain why here my deeply in the money put has an intrinsic value of $4, but a European put price or value that's actually less than the intrinsic value. This, to me, at first glance, seems counterintuitive. I have a put value with intrinsic value of four, but my European put price is worth less than that. Well, that's, that, that's really mostly a function of the dynamic we just talked about. Time could actually work against you if you're deeply in the money. And so here in this test, comparing the intrinsic value to the value of the European put, small p, um, my intrinsic value is actually greater, and so it may be optimal to early exercise. Now, if I increase the dividend, that shows up in my put price here, and in this case, 384 goes to 395, it's still a maybe. At 6% dividend, my put price actually exceeds my intrinsic value, and at this high dividend yield, putting downward pressure on the stock is finally overwhelming this rule and saying, no, in this case, not optimal to early exercise. So I won't, there's a final sheet in here where I follow a uh, McDonald with a more technical interpretation that's actually based on the waiting cost. Same idea as with the call. Remember in the call, we said deferring the strike, the deferring the purchase of the strike price is a benefit to us, a waiting value. In the put, deferring receipt of the strike is a waiting cost. So I quantify that. And because of the math, we would compare that to the call price. And so the optimal exercise can actually be reduced to, is the waiting cost greater than the value of a European call. And you'll get the same outcome as I got in this other sheet, but I won't go into the details of that because it actually requires the algebra to get to the derivation. But that's all in the spreadsheet that can be downloaded. And I hope that's some helpful insight into that question of, is it optimal to exercise early an American call or an American put? And you can see also the difference between the call and the put and why they're not symmetrical. If this video is helpful, please subscribe to the channel and get my updates on the next video. Thank you.